Today's video covers three specification points, and we're going to deal with internal energy, the concept of absolute zero, and ideal gases. To start off, internal energy. Now our specification doesn't say much about this, only that you need to understand it as the random distribution of the potential and kinetic energies of the molecule. So what does that really mean? If you take a glass of water like this and it's sitting on a table, it has no apparent energy, it's not moving, the glass of water is not moving, so therefore we wouldn't say it has kinetic energy. You might say it has gravitational potential energy, but if you look at it closer and look at the actual molecules, they are of course moving around. And the, their movement gives them molecular kinetic energy. So this is the kinetic energy that's referenced in this. The fact that there are forces between those molecules also means that they have potential energy. And so our internal energy is what we used to call at GCSE heat energy or thermal energy. Now it is considered to be internal energy. Internal energy is given the symbol U. Now, the internal energy of any substance is actually really difficult to calculate because you'd have to have actual numbers for the kinetic energy and potential energy of every single molecule and add it all up. And so usually, instead of trying to find what the internal energy of a substance is, instead we think about changes in internal energy. And so we deal with the concept of delta U. And there are two ways that you can change the internal energy of a substance. You can do work on it. And so you would look at how much energy you have added through work being done. Or you can heat it. And so you can look at how much energy you add through heating. Now there's a whole section of thermodynamics about this. But this is not something that we need to deal with. You just need to understand what the internal energy of a substance is made up of. Now we're going to start looking at ideal gases. And we'll talk about what constitutes an ideal gas later on. But in order to explore ideal gases and what are called the gas laws, we're going to start looking at how the pressure of a gas changes with its temperature. And for this, if you haven't discovered or explored already the FET interactive simulations, I would strongly recommend them. This is the general website up on the top here. And the one that I'm using is the gas properties. I will put both links in the description box below so that you can access them whenever you like. You'll find there are a whole host of simulations for all kinds of physics experiments. They're particularly good for the gas laws. And when you go in, what you'll find is this situation. I've clicked on ideal because I want to work with ideal gases. The first thing that you do is you add some particles. I've chosen to add 50 light particles in here and it distributes the particles into the box. And what you can do then is use this controller at the bottom to increase or decrease the temperature. Up here you can see the temperature gauge. I've left it at degrees Celsius deliberately, but you can have it on Kelvin. And of course there's a pressure gauge. And you just increase and decrease the temperature. Note the corresponding pressure. It fluctuates because of course pressure is caused by the collisions of the particles with the walls of the container. We know that pressure is calculated by force over area. So as the particles strike the area of the walls, and it's going to depend on lots of factors, which we'll discuss later on, but as the particles strike the walls, they exert a force on it. We have a fixed area because the volume of this container is fixed. And so we get a pressure. Now, at any one time, different numbers of particles might be striking the walls. So your pressure will fluctuate, but you can take the sort of median value of that pressure for experimental purposes. So if you take that data, you end up with something that looks like this. You can see that I've got temperature and pressure up here, and I've just taken eight values between minus 94 degrees Celsius and 236. When you plot those on a graph, this is what you get. These are my points up here, slight variation around the line as expected because I was taking the median value of pressure. But the key point here, first of all, is that as the temperature increases, the pressure increases, and vice versa, as temperature decreases, pressure decreases. And you can see the reason why I've used temperature in degrees Celsius here, because we can see that theoretically, as you decrease the temperature lower and lower and lower, the pressure drops down. And so there comes a point where your pressure actually drops to zero. And if we zoom in on this point, we can see it is there. 
that occurs at minus 273 degrees Celsius. Now, it is not possible to get a pressure less than zero, because at that point, the molecules have stopped moving and therefore are no longer striking the walls of the container and therefore not exerting a force. So this is considered to be the lowest possible temperature there is. And for that reason, it is called absolute zero. And it is the starting point for the Kelvin scale of temperature. And so it is considered to be zero degrees Kelvin. Now the intervals for the Kelvin scale are the same as for the Celsius scale. So one degree Kelvin is the same as minus 272 degrees Celsius. And so to convert from Celsius to Kelvin, you simply use this 273. So zero degrees Celsius is 273 Kelvin. You really do need to understand this relationship. Remember, as temperature increases, the speed of the particles are going to increase. And we'll come back to why that is in another video. But if the speed of the particles increases, that means that their momentum increases. And so when they strike the walls of the container, they have a greater change in momentum over time, which means a greater force. Provided, of course, that the internal area of the walls that they're striking remains constant. In other words, the volume of the container remains constant. And that means that the pressure increases. So there are two ways you can get a pressure increase, because the pressure is going to be the total for force exerted by all of the particles on the walls. So if you've got faster particles, as in this situation, then you're going to have greater force on the walls, or if you have got more particles in there, because you'll get more collisions per second and therefore a greater pressure increase. So that these are two of the factors that affect the pressure on the walls of a container. So we can see from this graph that pressure is proportional to temperature. We've just discussed that pressure is going to be proportional to the number of particles of the gas. So if you increase the number of particles, you increase the pressure. The third factor in here is the volume of the container. And I've referenced this in talking about the internal surface area of it. And this is actually Core Practical 14. And I have another video of Core Practical 14, which you can go and look at. And I will put it at the end of the video as a link. But Core Practical 14 is Boyle's Law. And Boyle's Law states that pressure is proportional to the inverse of the volume. So inversely proportional to the volume. Now you can take these three proportional relationships and put them into one. And so we say that pressure is proportional to the number of particles of the gas, it's proportional to temperature, and it's inversely proportional to volume. And if we do some cross multiplying there, we can see that P times V is going to be proportional to N times T. And so all we need to do then to turn this into an equation is add in a constant, giving us PV is equal to the constant K times N times T, more usually written as PV is equal to NKT. And this is our ideal gas equation, and you need to be able to use this. You do have to be very careful, of course, with your units, and remember that this is the absolute temperature. In other words, it is the temperature in Kelvin. So anytime you use this equation, make sure that you are putting your temperature in Kelvin. When we speak about ideal gases, and we use the kinetic theory of gases, and again, the next video will be about the equations that go with the kinetic theory, there are four assumptions that we make, and all of our mathematics are based upon these assumptions. So let's have a look through the, the four assumptions and the consequences of them. So first of all, all the molecules are identical in any particular gas. This means that each molecule at the same speed is going to exert the same force on the walls of the container because the change in momentum will be the same. So that's an important one. And that they are in what is called Brownian motion, this random motion, which means that at any one time we can average out the number of molecules that are going to be striking the walls of the container. The second is that all our collisions are elastic. So we're not losing any energy here to the walls of the container. This is a closed system. 
The kinetic energy that the molecules have before the collision is the same kinetic energy as they have after the collision, so the energy remains inside the gas. The volume of the molecules is negligible compared to that of the gas as a whole. So there's lots of space between the particles. That is what we're saying. So that when we reduce the volume of the container, we don't have to consider the volume of the molecules of the gas. And then very crucially, we are ignoring potential energy. And we are saying in an ideal gas, all of the internal energy is kinetic energy. So no forces exist between the particles, so we don't have to worry about their potential energy.